On this week's GCN Racing News Show, we'll look back at an incredibly exciting week of track racing from the Tokyo Olympics with controversy, drama and a number of world records falling. We've also got the Arctic Race of Norway and the Vuelta Burgos, which gave us some indications as to who's hot and who's not for the upcoming Vuelta España. Plus, we've got a lot of transfer news to fill you in on too. Better get started. With so many events on the track over the final week of the Olympics, the team pursuit already feels like a lifetime ago. But that's what I'm going to start with. The drama began in qualifying with Alex Porter crashing heavily in the second half of the event caused by his 3D printed bars failing on him. It looked really nasty and it was remarkable that he was even able to get back up for a second time with Australia. I mean, he must have been going at over 65 kilometers per hour when he hit the board with all sorts of burns over the front of his face and body. But get back on his bike he did and Australia would qualify fifth fastest. But who knows how much that first aborted run had taken out of their minds and bodies. There was more drama when Great Britain went up against Denmark in the runoff for the final. The Brits came unstuck in the closing stages with Charlie Tanfield detached from his remaining two teammates. As the third rider, it was Tanfield time that would count, and so he continued to ride the black line at the bottom of the track. Behind him, Denmark were closing in fast on him, and with his head down, Frederick Madsen rode straight into the back of Tanfield, resulting in another high-speed crash. Madsen was mad. But he shouldn't have been. Tanfield had every right to continue in the way that he did, and Madsen should have led the Danish team around him. Now, after that, there was a bit of confusion as to which team should qualify for the final, but the commissaires decided it would be the Danes that should progress. And regardless of how you read the letter of the law or the UCI rules, I thought it was good to have the two fastest teams in the final. That other team being Italy, who had taken the Danes' world record in qualifying with a 3.42.307. Now, the final was one of the most tantalizing and exciting races I have ever seen in any sport, I think. Italy started up, but then the Danes got up to full speed and looked to be heading to gold. However, somehow, Italy found the strength and speed to come back at them, with thousands of a second separating the two in the closing laps of the race. The gap at the line was 0.166 of a second in the favour of Italy, who'd just beaten their own world record, taking the 4K team pursuit down to just 3 minutes, 42 seconds, 0.032. Simone Consoni, Francesco Le Mans, Jonathan Milan and Filippo Ganna take a bow. That was sports entertainment and performance at its very best. Now, the speeds on the track always stagger me, and so I'm going to go through some of the more interesting numbers of that event now. That time, 4.4 kilometers, gives an average speed of 64.856 kilometers per hour, or 40.3 miles per hour. That's from a standing start. And looking at Dr. Xavier Disley's breakdown of it on Twitter, you can see that both teams peaked at well over 68 kilometers per hour, which is just ridiculous. Next time you're out riding and you get up to that speed on a descent, just imagine doing it just millimeters from the tire in front of you for three minutes and 42 seconds. It's utterly bonkers. And you just never get the sense of that speed when you're watching it on TV. Fair play to the Australians too though, they picked themselves up to get a bronze medal at the end of it all. Now, world records also tumbled in the women's team pursuit, four times no less. Germany smashed the previous record by almost three seconds in qualifying, only for Team GB to better that mark by over a half a second in round one. Germany lopped the same amount of time off the Brits in the same round just a few minutes later, and when the two teams met in the final, the Germans went even better, taking almost two seconds off their own world record set just the day before, which means a new mark for the women's team pursuit is at four minutes, four seconds, 0.242. Now, the progression of the women's world record in the 4K team pursuit has been huge. The distance was only elevated from three kilometers back in 2013, and the first time that elite riders rode that distance in competition, they set a benchmark of four minutes, 32.721. That was the Great Britain team who took it down to 410.236 at the Rio Olympics in 2016. The new record set by Germany is faster than the men's record set by Australia in 1993. And whilst there's no doubt that equipment and clothing has come a long way since then, it's very exciting to see just how quickly the women's times are coming down. I've got no doubt that it won't be long until we see the first sub four minutes, which seemed like the unbeatable barrier in the men's pursuit until Germany achieved it at the Sydney Olympics in the year 2000. Now, there were so many other events on the boards in Tokyo that I don't have time to go through all of them, so I'll go over some of the other records and exceptional performances. 
The only other world record was set in the women's team sprint. China riding to a 31.804 in the heat. They'd go on to beat Germany in the final to take the gold medal. Plenty of Olympic records were broken though, with the Dutch men's team particularly dominant in that regard. Jeffrey Hoagland and Harry Levrason both did a 9.215 in the men's flying start 200 meters in qualifying, an average speed of over 78 kilometers per hour. Levrason got the better of his teammate in the final to take gold there. Leah Sophie Friedrich of Germany also set an Olympic record in the women's 200 meter flying start in qualifying with a 10.310, but at the end of it all, she wasn't able to even take a medal. Canada's Kelsey Mitchell took the gold home in that event. There were some big names who missed out on gold in the women's Omnium. Laura Kenny had a crash in the first round, an awful crash in fact, which affected half the field. She then won the second round, but was uncharacteristically out of position in the elimination race, which is exactly what you don't want to be in that event. The same went for Annette Edmondson and Kirsten Veal, although the experienced Dutch woman would end up with a bronze medal at the end of the Omnium. Jennifer Valente, though, was in great form and importantly was consistent over the four events to take gold in the women's Omnium. In the men's event, it was won by Team GB's Matt Walls. Jason Kenny became Team GB's most decorated Olympian when he won the Kieran race in a dramatic and controversial final. So he was on the wheel of the e-bike as it pulled off, but Australia's Matthew Glatzer behind him had left such a big gap that Kenny just went for it, never to be seen again. His average speed over the final three laps, or 750 metres, was over 68 kilometres per hour. That marked his seventh gold medal and his ninth Olympic medal in total. Chapeau. Now, the discussion as to what happened, though, in that final continues to rumble on and wasn't really helped by this tweet from the Australian Olympic Committee, which hailed Glater's outstanding tactics when many thought it was his mistake that cost everybody but Kenny a chance of the gold medal. It was certainly a dramatic few days, though, in the velodrome, wasn't it? However you looked at it. And the good news is that there's plenty more to come this year. Not only do we have the European and World Track Championships to look forward to, but also the brand new UCI Track Champions League. That's going to be held over six events between the 6th of November and the 11th of December on consecutive weekends, where we'll see the world's best sprinters and endurance riders line up and duke it out for a substantial cash prize. The format is new, with some very exciting events that will be run off in quick succession to give two hours of non-stop entertainment. Happy days! You'll be able to watch Cyclocross on GCN Plus first on Sundays and some exhilarating track action after that. Off-season? What off-season? We've got to the point now where we can watch some cracking bike racing year-round live on our screens, and I, for one, am loving it. Now, for those of you who want to know more about the new UCI Track Champions League and its format, we'll leave a link in the description just down below this video. Moving on, and the four-day Arctic tour of Norway concluded yesterday in Harstad. Four days of great racing, stunning scenery, and decent weather for the most part. Uh, Marcus Hulgaard stole a march on everybody else on day one, attacking over the top of the final climb and dropping his companion on the run into the finish. That marked the second pro win for the Uno X rider, the previous one coming at this same race two years ago. Day two was the only bunt sprint at the race. Alexander Kristoff looking to take his first win of the season, and he was looking good after a decent lead out from the Norwegian national team, only to be pipped by Martin Lars of Bora Hansgrohe on the finish line. Kristoff's consolation prize that he went into the leader's jersey, but only for a day, because stage three was a much hillier affair and always looked set to shape the overall general classification. After an aggressive race, we had a three-up sprint to the line with Ben Hermans taking it ahead of odd Christian Eiking and Victor Le Fay and moving himself into the race lead in a midnight sun jersey in the process. His team, Israel Startup Nation, did a great job of defending that lead on the last day, won by the early breakaway. This time it was a two-up sprint to the line with cyclocross specialist Philip Valsleben of Alps in Phoenix taking the team's 22nd professional road win of the season. Just behind him, Nicky Terpstra. Great to see him getting back to some good form after a tough couple of years. There was no change on the general classification though. Hermans took the honours and with that, he's hoping to have his contract renewed by his team. Meanwhile, down in Spain, we had the Vuelta a Burgos, a race often used as a warm-up for the Vuelta a España for those that haven't raced the Tour de France. Stage one saw one of the longest uphill lead-outs I think I've ever seen. It was from Roman Bardet, but unfortunately, he was ultimately pipped to the line by four other riders, with Edward Plancart of Alpes in Fenix taking his first pro win. 
That stage spelt the end of the hopes of most of the Ineos Grenadiers star riders, with Bernal, Martinez and Adam Yates all held up in a crash. Milano of UAE Team Emirates won the bunch sprint on day two, but Bardet was back at it the following day, and this time did enough to win solo by almost 40 seconds despite a crash. That was Bardet's first win in three and a half years, and his first win outside of France. I had to double check that fact, but it is indeed true. He and his team defended that lead on stage four, which won again by Milano in a sprint, and so it all came down to the fifth and final stage. That finished up the climb to Lagunas de Nela, and it was Hugh Carthy who took the win there from Ina Rubio, Simon Yates, Egan Bernal, and Jay Vine. But with all five of those riders out of the GC before that day, there was a lot to play for behind them. So in sixth place, just 16 seconds behind Carthy, was Mikel Lander of Bahrain Victorious, and with that, he'd done enough to win the race overall. That's his first win since he took a stage of the Copia Bartoli race two and a half years ago, and his first GC win since the Vuelta Burgos in 2017. Things are looking pretty good for La Vuelta, aren't they? Could he finally win a Grand Tour? Well, I think almost all of us would be pretty pleased if he did. Fabio Aru managed to take the second step of the podium. Great to see him back on form as well. And it was Mark Padun in third, Sivakov in fourth, De La Cruz in fifth, all of whom will be riding La Vuelta, which starts on Saturday. So just before we move on, a quick heads up as to what we've got coming up on GCN Plus this week. And it's mainly about La Vuelta. The third and final Grand Tour of the year starts this coming Saturday with an eight kilometer individual time trial in Burgos. And it looks like it's going to be a sweltering start, with forecasts predicting temperatures in the high 30s. Roglic, Bernal, Lander, Carapaz, Lander and Carthy are amongst the star names on the provisional start list, so the competition should be just as hot, and you'll be able to watch the whole thing live on GCN Plus if you're in Europe or the Asia Pacific, excluding China, New Zealand and Japan. We'll also have every stage on demand, plus short and long highlights if you aren't able to catch it live. The Breakaway, our pre and post stage analysis show, will also be back, as will all of Shenoui, who's hosting it, plus a whole heap of special guests, including Sean Kelly, former winner of La Vuelta, and just about every other race on the planet, Brad Wiggins, Nico Roach, and many more. Now, along with all of that, we'll also keep you up to date with all the news from the race on the GCN app, where you'll also have a load of polls and quizzes for you to get involved with, plus in-depth race previews and much, much more. So if you're not already subscribed, I recommend doing so if you're in the right territory. Now, before La Vuelta begins, we've also got the Tour of Denmark. The five-day race kicks off tomorrow, Tuesday the 10th of August, and we'll see Mark Cavendish reunited with Mikkel Mirko, fresh from his gold medal winning ride at the Madison in Tokyo. Didn't mention that one, did I? But I was thoroughly pleased to see Mirko get that gold medal and get a win with Lassen Norman Hansen. Those two definitely deserve it. Nizzolo, Grunewagen, Pedersen, Morechko, Moschetti and Boll will be amongst the sprinters lining up who will be hoping to beat Mark Cavendish to the line. Whilst for the GC, his teammate Avonapool and Lampard will be looking to light things up. They'll face competition from Rasmus Tiller, Soren Krauanson, Harry Sweeney, Mike Turnerson and others. That one is live every day in all GCN Plus territories. And that's not all. We've got the Ladies Tour of Norway starting on Thursday. It's another race that's available everywhere that you can access GCN Plus, and it's got a stellar lineup. Voss, Van Fleurten, Cecily Utrup, Ludwig, Garcia, Chabi, Dijgnan, Wild, Cordon Rago, Brandt, Rivera, Lippert, Fisher Black, and Cavalli are amongst the many stars taking part in this World Tour race. Live commentary will come from Marty McDonald and Danny Rowe on that one. Now, beyond the racing, we've got the next part of our Lotus documentary already out. So last week's early one focused on the historical bikes that changed the game when it came to space age technology and cycling. And the next one looked at the new Hope bike developed in conjunction with Lotus. That's the one Team G have been using on the track in Tokyo. Here's a trailer for you. When somebody gives you the job, make me the best you can, and these are the rules, you really have to try and push it to the edge of these rules. We've got this idea for a new bike for the Olympics. It looks different than all the bikes you've seen in the last 10 years. This blows them straight out of the water. The Hope bike, the HPT, is significantly faster. The Hope bike is actually very light. It's the stiffest bike I've ever ridden, and it's quick as well. Olympic athletes invest everything in pushing the limits of human ability. The same effort is applied to developing the bike tech used by these riders. If you haven't already seen that one, it's available in all GCN Plus territories and is out now. 
On to some other news, and the UCI unfortunately announced last week that four late season races had been cancelled. Three of them were in China, the men's and women's tour de Huangxi, plus the tour of Chongming, which is part of the women's world tour. And the other event that was fallen victim to the ongoing measures put in place to curb the coronavirus is the Bema Sea Classics in Hamburg, which had been due to take place in just under two weeks from now. Patrick Moster, the German coach who was heard encouraging one of his team to catch the camel riders in the Olympic Games time trial, has been banned by the UCI until the end of the year. The German Federation haven't put out an official statement just yet, but they have said he will not work with the national squad for an indefinite period of time. And Patrick Lefebvre, whose head newsblad column two weeks ago compared Sam Bennett's return to Bora Hansgrohe with a woman returning home after an abusive relationship, has apologised for that comment in his latest column. I didn't expect him to say sorry, so credit where it's due, although he did say his opinion on Sam Bennett has remained unchanged. Now, Bennett's move back to the German squad was confirmed last week. He signed a two-year deal with that team. But we've got a load of transfers to go through on today's show, and the biggest news comes from the UAE Team Emirates camp. They will see a number of high-profile riders exit next year, but also join the team. Now, the first of those is the Portuguese sensation Joao Almeida. He's on a long-term contract at UAE that will take him through to the end of 2026 at least. But also joining the team is Marc Soler. He spent his entire pro career at Mobistar so far, but the 27-year-old joins UAE on a two-year deal. And it's going to be very interesting to see how many opportunities those two riders get for themselves at their new team and how much they just have to support Tadej Pugacar. Now, one man who will be hoping he doesn't have to ride for Bogatia at the team is Pascal Ackermann. The German sprinter was long rumoured to be leaving Bora Hansgrohe, and last week it was confirmed that his destination is UAE, where he'll spend at least the next two seasons. Leaving UAE Team Emirates are the Norwegian pairing of Sven Erik Bistrom and Alexander Kristoff, both of whom are heading to Antomarche Wanty Gobert. Kristoff, who is now 34 years old, looks to have signed a one year deal, whilst Bistrom is on the books for two. The team have also signed the young Eritrean talent, Berniam Grimet, who is impressed with a string of top 10 results in one day races over the past couple of seasons, as well as winning the Tour de Rwanda GC in 2019. Now, the other very high profile transfer confirmation is that of Peter Sagan moving to Total Energies. Uh, this one has been rumoured for a long time, of course, and it was just a case of waiting for confirmation of that, and indeed, how many of his entourage he took with him. Well, the answer is three riders, so his brother Uri, plus Maciej Bodnar and Daniel Oss. But along with the riders, Sagan is also bringing an entire bike brand with him, Specialised. Now, we're yet to hear whether that means Bora will have a new bike partner for next year, but I'd hazard a guess that they will, with Specialized already on board with the Koenig Quickstep 2. Meanwhile, Michael Storer, who won his first two pro races last week at the Tour de Land, will be moving on next year to Groupama FDJ. That continues a long run of Australians at that team, including Brad McGee, Baden Cook, Matt Wilson, Mark Renshaw, Wesley Salzberger, and Miles Scottson. Uh, that team has also signed Quinton Pacher from B&B Hotels. Trek Segafredo has signed John Aberasturi, the 32-year-old currently rides at Caja Rural. This won't be his first stint in the World Tour, though, because he was with Escatel Escadi back in 2013. Now, last week, we reported on Bora Hansgrohe having signed Jai Hindley and Sergio Igita, bolstering their climbing talent. Well, they've bolstered it even more now because news has just come in that Alexander Vlasov will be leaving Astana, having signed a three-year deal with Bora Hansgrohe. They'll be a force to be reckoned with in the mountains too, won't they? Oh, one more. Rudiger Selig, officially the nicest man in pro cycling, is moving from Bora over to Lotto Sudal. He'll line up there with Caleb Ewan, who's just signed an extension that will keep him at the team until the end of 2024. So, that's it for another racing news show. I'm not going to be here next week, so I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Connor Dunn. He'll be reporting on the opening two days of La Vuelta a España. And don't forget, you'll be able to watch our big preview of that race with me and Connor in a couple of days' time. See you soon, everybody. Bye for now.